He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how peace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. tonight. Let's take just a few moments, shake hands with those around us, and we will continue in worship. Hey guys, that you make your way back to your seat. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Actually, um, we're going to sing a song for you this morning. I hope that you guys will um, listen to the words of the song. The focus this morning, uh, the theme throughout the day musically is, is God's faithfulness. And um, we sang this song last week at um, the Hicks and Chattanooga campuses. And, and I really want us to not miss this moment 
of, of worship. When I look around at our church, when I look around at my friends and the people on this stage, I can see God's faithfulness in everything that he's done in my life. And um, he hasn't always given me what I've wanted, but he's always been faithful to give me what I needed. And so I want you guys to focus this morning on him, not on us, but what we're here to do this morning, and that's to worship our Father in his faithfulness.
promises great is your faithfulness faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise your promise you say great is your Continue to stand with us. Let's continue to worship this morning.
pray this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, this morning we thank you that because of your son, sinners like us can come into the presence of of a holy God. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for your love. Father, this morning I pray that as we just sang that we will be more aware of your presence. Scripture tells us that you are there. Scripture tells us you will never leave us. Because of sin, sometimes we walk through this life and we feel alone. So this morning, Father, I pray that we will be aware that you are there, that you are with us, that you love us. Father, I pray that you'll be with us during this time. I pray that you will be lifted up. I pray that you will be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, you can reach in a chair in front of you. There should be a, maybe a, a Bible underneath the seat right there. Love to have you in, uh, follow along with us as we study the Word of God today. Um, if you don't have a Bible, take that one that's underneath the chair. If you'll open it to the front, put your name in it. It's, it's yours. Merry Christmas. Yeah? little Christmas present. We'd love to have you study the Word of God with us. We believe that the Bible changes people's lives. It changes uh, your outlook, changes your whole being. Uh, how many got a chance to uh, hear uh, Scott Humpston over the last t- couple of days? Right? Good. Good crowd. Good crowd. Let me tell you, I, I'm excited about tonight. Tonight, Scott will be here at this campus, and he's doing the family program. I'm telling you, if you have kids that are, I don't know, my, my two-year-old grandson was laughing his head off. I mean, and uh, uh, my four-year-old uh, grandson as well. So they, they had a great time. So it's, it's family night. It's kids. Uh, there's going to be a lot of kids in here, and it's just going to be a great time uh, for tonight. It starts at 5 o'clock. It's going to be in our 5 o'clock. Our Awana program is going to be over here. Our youth are going to be here. And, and I want to encourage you to bring a friend, bring a family member, bring your kids, bring your grandkids. It's just going to be a great night tonight at 5 o'clock. See Scott Humpson. Incredible magic. Uh, for those that saw it, matter of fact, some folks have already told me they're coming back. They want to try and see, try to figure out some of those magic tricks and what he did. So that'll be tonight at five o'clock. Uh, and I'd love to invite you to be out to uh, see Scott Humpston uh, to do uh, his illusions. And then he's going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've seen many people come forward in the last couple of nights. It's just absolutely amazing. Give their hearts and life to Jesus Christ. And we're excited about uh, how uh, God is using Scott in a very special way uh, to reach people for the cause of Christ through magic. Through magic, illusions, he'll tell you that it's all fake, all right? There's nothing real about it, uh, just you can't figure it out, you know, so as you watch it. So that's tonight at 5 o'clock. Let me encourage you, please come back to be a part of this. Last night, he, he had a heavy subject. Uh, we tried to communicate to people that on Saturday night, he was speaking on a subject that probably for 12 and over would be a little heavy on them. Had a couple families that were a little upset. They came and, isn't he doing magic? Well, he's going to do that, but he's going to talk about the occult. And some of you were here last night and heard him talk about the occult and what goes on in the world in which we live today. And we can live sheltered lives at times, but there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on around the world in the name of God. And uh, spiritism, uh, you know, spirituality, that's, what, that's the new phrase. It's not a matter of are you a Christian or do you, do you believe in Jesus. It's just I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. Well, that can mean a whole variety of things, whole variety. So last night he spoke about that, and I want to pick up what he was talking about. I thought he was going to preach my message last night. Uh, I'm preaching on the three forces that are at work in the world, the three forces at work in the world. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 5 right here, Mark chapter 5. And, and when you study the Bible, you understand that there was a particular group of people that Mark was writing to. If you look at the book of Matthew, he's writing to the Jews, and he's presenting Jesus as the Messiah. So he deals with the birth uh, birthright 
despite all that. You come to the book of Luke, and Luke is dealing with Jesus as the Son of Man. That he goes all the way back to Adam, and he shows his genealogy from uh, all the way back to Adam, and, and he gets into him being the Son of Man. John presents him as the Son of God. His genealogy is, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, the word became flesh. And that's his genealogy right there. God became a man. But when you study Mark, no genealogy. Mark's writing to the Romans. They want to know, what have you done for me lately? Right? And so every time we turn around, Jesus is on the move and he's, he's doing great things. He's, he's got a divine appointment. He's left heaven. He's born of a virgin. He's the son of God. And he's impacting the world right here. Now, when we get to chapter 5, let me give you a heads up. Unfortunately... Chapter divisions and verse divisions were given later on. When the Bible was, when, Mark, when this was penned, it, it, uh, it didn't have chapter and verses in it. You know what I'm talking about right here? You look at chapter five, you were able to get there. That's why they put chapter divisions in there. If you had a scroll and I said, turn to that one about Jesus and uh, uh, the guy at Gadaris or whatever, you'd say, oh, you know, t- start looking for it. Well, now we have chapter divisions and we have verse divisions. Unfortunately, there's a division between verse uh, uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5. It should really go together. So to get the context, before we get into chapter 5 and see this divine appointment that God has with this guy, we got to go back to chapter 4 and see what's going on. If you go back to chapter 4, just turn back to chapter 4 and uh, notice what it says in uh, verse 35. Verse 35 of chapter 4. We're going to get down to chapter 5, but I want you to see this verse. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But it was in the... By the way, that's not a good thing when the boat starts filling up with water, all right? Just let you know. Just a kind of spoiler alert, all right? It's filling up with water. It says, uh, and, and, but he, he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the waves and the sea. Peace be still. Basically, he said, sit down. That's what he really said. That's the original line. Sit down. And the wind ceased, and it was a great calm. And he said to them, why, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? What do you mean no faith? I mean, these are seasoned sailors and they're going across the other side. Jesus told them we're going across. He has a divine appointment. They don't know about that appointment though, all right? He just said, let's get in the boat, go to the other side. They get in the boat, they head halfway across. Where's Jesus? He's in the bottom of the boat. What's he doing? He's sleeping. He's having good sleep too. This was planned sleep. How do I know it was planned? Because he had his my pillow. He said he had a pillow, so he was going to get some good sleep. But it's kind of interesting. As Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat, this storm comes up. And by the way, it didn't catch Jesus by surprise. We're going to get to that in just a bit. But it didn't catch Jesus by surprise. But these guys had never seen a storm like this before. It was filling, the water was filling the boat. They were going to sink. They were all going to die. They went down and said, hey, Jesus, hey, it's nice knowing you, but we're all going to die. And Jesus kind of gets up, and I, I wonder if he stretched. That's how I was always on. He stretched. He goes up to the top of the ship. Now, you got to get this. This is great. There's a storm that's just going crazy. And he looks, and he says, sit down. Basically, peace be said. Sit down. And you know what happened? While well, they were screaming like little girls, ah! You know, all of a sudden, it just, it ceased. It just stopped right there. What stopped? The winds and the waves. Now, bear in mind, if, if, if you know how winds work, winds don't just stop. They don't go, whoosh. That doesn't happen, right? They die down, the winds, right? Winds go, they die down. Well, what's amazing, while they may die down, waves don't just stop. When you have waves, you're talking maybe a couple of days if you've ever been on the ocean. How many have ever been on the ocean after a storm? And it, wasn't, and it was a couple of days later even. You know, or you're on a cruise and they're taking you through and there's already been a storm there a couple of days and the boat's kind of rocking and stuff. And uh, the waves just don't stop. I, I remember I went deep sea fishing. Anybody ever been deep sea fishing? Wow. Are you ever going to go again? <laughs> I went one, one time. That was it for me. I'm one of those. I get motion sick very easy. 
all right? And uh, we went to, we went to on a trip with my parents and, and they were talking about going deep sea fishing and they were talking about, hey, you want to go? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't just, I get motion sickness and I, there was a storm the other day and I want to be out there and I can already see, our, you know, uh, that, that there's going to be a lot of waves. And they said, hey, listen, all, all you got to do is there's this uh, clip that you get and put on your ear and you'll be fine. It's like, I'm not falling for that. A little clip on your ear like a clothespin and that's supposed to settle. No, I'm not doing it. And one guy took me and said, hey, seriousness. He says, he said, I have these little pills. I take them. And uh, he, he said, I have a good breakfast and then I'll eat these and, and no motion sickness whatsoever. I said, are you serious? He said, absolutely. No problem whatsoever. You just, these little pills, they help you in motion sickness. So I had a breakfast and I'm usually not a breakfast eater. I'm just a coffee drinker. But I had breakfast because I knew we'd be out all day. And I took the little pills, and then we went out, and we got out there, and the farther we got out, the waves got bigger, and as well as you could see the shore, and you couldn't see the shore. Then you could see the shore, then you couldn't see the shore. I grabbed that chum bucket, and I knew it was coming. Sure enough, boom. You know what? Those pills were the first things that came out. <laughs> they were the first things that came out. And all this stuff had followed, and my pills were at the top of it going, help me. I've never been so sick in my life. I went to the bottom. It's like, I just, I, 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 I would rather died right then. It was so bad. I mean, I remember coming off the boat. Someone said, Amanda, the, you, you were in bad lighting or something. You look green. I said, I, I was green, right? It was so bad. I, the motion sickness. And you find out from, from that, waves just don't stop. But when Jesus said, sit down, the wind, the wind stopped and then the waves stopped. And while they're going, ah, ah, ah they look around. And Jesus said, where's your, where's your faith? Well, we had it over there, okay? But they looked at one another. I don't want you to miss this. They looked at one another. And they were probably looking at Jesus. And they looked at each other and said, hey, what kind of man is this that the winds and the waves obey him? I can tell you what that man is. He's the God man. He's Jesus Christ, the son of God. And he, when he said, sit down, the winds and the waves sat down. That got their attention big time. Now, look what it says in chapter 5, verse well, Look at chapter 4, verse 33. It said, I mean, uh, verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let's cross over to the other side. This is Jesus. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Then they came where? To the other side. Well, Jesus said we're going to the other side. They thought they were going to die. They thought, this is it. We've never seen a storm like this. It's all over. But he gets them to the other side, and they're even asking, what kind of man is it? This is the God man. And the God man has a divine appointment that's been planned in eternity past with this guy that's going to be at this place. I, I want you to notice, though, what's at work here. Satan is alive and well. Matter of fact, I want you to see the work of Satan, the work of Satan. I hear people say, you really believe in a real devil? Yeah, yeah, there's a real devil. People say, come on, there's a, real, there's a real Satan. Let me say this. Do you know that Jesus believed in a real Satan? Jesus spoke to Satan. Go back and look at Matthew 4 and Luke 4. They got into a debate after he had fasted for 40 days, and they're going at it back and forth. Matter of fact, Satan quotes Bible verses. How about that? Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it's kind of interesting in this passage, I, I'll just say a couple things about Satan right off the bat. When we talk about the work of Satan, I want you to know that he is a threat to all. He is a threat to all. He has power. Satan has power. I'm convinced, verse 37 of chapter 4, was caused by Satan. Look what it says. And a great windstorm arose. Where, where did that come out of? I mean, it was so bad. It wasn't just any normal windstorm. They, I mean, Peter and those, the other guys that were, that were uh, fishermen, they had been through some tough storms, but never like this before. Matter of fact, they, this is it. We're done. And what was, what was going on is you have Satan behind the scenes trying to sink the plan and program of God. But Jesus already said, we're going to the other side. Let's get in the boat. And so I believe that uh, Satan has great power. He has power over spiritual things, over physical things, nature and things like that. But he also has power over spiritual things as well. Satan has great power. Not only does he have great power, he has great authority. He has great authority. There's a difference in power and authority. And by the way, he doesn't have authority over everyone. He doesn't have authority over everyone. He has power over everyone. 
Satan can intervene in the life of a believer and, and throw fiery darts and come after them, but you're going to find out that he cannot do that unless he gets permission from God. He has power, but in your life, he ha- if you're a believer, he has no authority whatsoever. No authority whatsoever. Matter of fact, look what it says in Colossians 1. This is a great verse. I, f- I saw this verse a couple of years ago. What a great impact. It says, who hath delivered us? Talking about Jesus Christ. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and hath transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. You see that word there for power? There's two, there's two Greek words for power. Two Greek words. There's one called dunamis. Uh, we get our word dynamite from it. When he says that uh, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You have dynamite power. But there's another word that's used for power. That, and it's, this isn't dunamis. This is not the word for dunamis. It is the word exousia. Exousia. Did you get goosebumps on that? It was a Greek word. What is that? It doesn't mean power. It means authority. And before you came to Jesus Christ, he had authority in your life. He has authority. He had authority in your life. But once you got saved, Jesus brought you out, turned your life around. Now you're on your way. I'm looking forward to hearing that song. I'm telling you what, he's, he took him out. He, he took you out of the, the authority of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son. Nothing can touch you there unless God allows it. You look at the Old Testament, the book of Job. Where did Satan go? And by the way, Satan has free roam. They think that, oh, Satan's in hell, right? No, no, no. He's as far away from that place as he can get. That's his ultimate doom. He knows that. But he's on a, he's on a mission right now. And he goes before the throne after he was cast out of heaven. In Job chapter 1, there he is before the throne. According to Revelation chapter 12, if you get to Revelation 12, 10, it says he stands before the throne day and night accusing the brethren. That's what he does. Accusing the brethren day and night. Wow, there's two things we're told to do day and night. You remember what they are? Pray without ceasing, right? And meditate on the word of God day and night, day and night. What's well, kind of interesting, Satan's free to roam. He has, he has power on everybody. But for the believer, if he ever comes into our life, he has to get permission from God to be able to do it. Remember, God allowed him to do it in the, in the life of Job. And so there are things behind the scenes. So he has authority. He has authority. He has power and authority. Not only is he a threat to all, he's a thief to some. He's a thief to some. It's interesting that John chapter 10 says, the thief cometh not. And there's three things he wants to do. To steal to steal. Another thing he wants to do is to kill and he wants to destroy. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, who does he do that to? Well, he goes after anybody he can get. When he comes as a thief, uh, there are things he wants to take from your life. First of all, if you're a believer, he wants to take your joy. I'll tell you that. He wants to take your joy from you. When you became a believer, you had the joy of God. Jesus said, these things I haven't spoken to you that your joy may be full. And by the way, there's a difference between joy and happiness. We're getting ready to start on a brand new uh, journey here next week on the book of Philippians. And we're going to talk about the journey, uh, how difficult it is, but God has given us joy along with the journey. But that's the one thing that Satan would want to steal from you is your joy. Not only your joy, he wants to take your peace, your peace. Jesus said, he breathed and says, my peace I give unto you, my peace I give. And think about it. What are the first three fruit of the Spirit? What's the first thing? He gives when you become a believer. Love, what's the second one? Joy, and then what? Peace. The very three things that Jesus talked about in the upper room. No less than five times he said to love one another. Love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. Well, why did he say it five times? Because we have a hard time loving one another. It's not goosebumps, love. It's a matter of choosing the highest good for another individual. Not only does he want to take the love, he wants to take the joy. He wants to take our peace. Why? Because he is a thief from the very beginning. He wants to steal from you. Not only that, he wants to kill you. So he wants to kill you. To do everything he can to discourage and take away your joy and your peace. And there are a lot of people that, you know, you wonder, how in the world did these people commit suicide? How, how did that happen? Well, they just got so discouraged they couldn't go on anymore. Not only does he want to steal and to kill, he wants to destroy he wants to take as many people to hell as he can. He knows that's his ultimate doom. And hell was never prepared for man. It was only prepared for the devil and his angels. And what Satan wants to do is take as many people to hell as he can. So we see that he is a threat to all and he's a thief to some. 
a thief to some. There's not only the work of Satan in the world, there's also the work of society. Look what it says in uh, verse 2. It says, after they came to the other side, it says, and when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. Wow. Is that that divine appointment you were talking about, Brother Gary? Absolutely. Jesus knew he was there. That's why he said, we're going to go to the other side. He had that divine appointment with this guy. And society is kind of interesting. Did you notice what this guy is doing? It says, notice again, verse two. And when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He's demon possessed. Notice what it says next. Who had his dwellings among the what? The tomb. He hung out in a graveyard. That was his home. He felt more comfortable there than any other place. Home's where your, where your heart is and where your head is, right? He was more comfortable in a graveyard. Why is that? Because birds of a feather, thank you, flock together. He's hanging out with dead people. Why? Because this guy's dead on the inside. He's dead on the inside. You're going to find out how, how, how bad this gets in just a moment. You gotta be very careful. Some people open themselves up to demon possessions. Demon possession doesn't happen by accident. It's kind of interesting. This, this guy is demon possessed and he's hanging out in the graveyard. And, and again, he's, he's hanging out because he feels more comfortable. And my, my saying is this, I, I believe your best friends ought to be the people you go to church with. Why? Because birds of a feather flock together. You come together, you hang out together, you encourage one another. You build up one another. Well, this guy was hanging out at the graveyard. Look what it says in verse 3 again. It says, Who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. In here, as uh, the work of society, here's what society does. When people are different, when people look like they've lost their mind, when there's no controlling these kind of people, you know what they try to do? First of all, they tried to bind him. They tried to bind him. Look what, and then look, look what it says in verse 3 who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces. Whoa. He could break chains and chains. Yeah. Kind of looks superhuman, doesn't he? You got to understand, this guy is demon-possessed, and this is kind of different right there. And if they, if, they couldn't, if they couldn't bind him, then let's tame him. Let's take him through a program to tame him. Matter of fact, look what it says next. Neither could anyone tame him. You see, got this program. If we can get him through this program and understand that, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. He wasn't okay. He had some problems in his life. He was overwhelmed by these problems. This unclean spirit who was dwelling within him. And it's kind of interesting in this. We see how society tried to bind him. They tried to tame him. And what did they do? They, they did what they always do. They, they finally just isolated him. Just go away. They isolated him. And when they isolated him, notice what happened in the very next verse, verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and doing what? What's it say? And cutting himself. I don't want you to miss this. He was cutting himself. See, it's kind of interesting in psychology. They say that's kind of a new thing. It's not, nothing new about that. That goes all the way back. To, I mean, this is a, a, a fallen thing right here. He's cutting himself. Why is he cutting himself? It's the same reason people cut themselves today. It's the same reason why people get involved with anorexia today. They have no control over their life, and so they try to make a, a control, and this is what happens. And here's this guy who had no control. Once he was demon-possessed, he couldn't go any further, so what would he do? He'd cry out and he'd cut himself, so he thought he had some control, but it never satisfied. This was a guy who had no help from society whatsoever. None. Zero. And when you have no help, let me tell you something, it always leads to the next step. What is that? There's no hope. There's no hope. Let me tell you something. As a believer, we understand that same principle. You can't find help in the world. Find some assistance or something, but you're not going to find true help. You know where true help comes from? Psalm 121. You need to write that down. Psalm 121 says this, the very first verse. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of of heaven and earth. How about that? The one who's spoken into existence says he's willing to, to give you the help that you need in your life. But a lot of people turn away from God, 
turn away from those things and want to do it their own way. And they find their lives in ruin. When there's no help, I can tell you this, there's never any hope. That's why God is here to give us hope. But there's no hope. When it comes to society trying to to, to bind them or to tame them or isolate them, they end up giving them no help and no hope. Years ago, I heard someone say this, and it's so true, it rings true. You can live 30 days without food. You can live three days without water. You can live three minutes without air. But you can't live one second without hope. You want to see a hopeless man? Look at verse 5. Night and day, he was crying out and trying to cut himself. That's where that leads to right there. That's the work of society. That's the best they can do. The best they can do. Well, we see the work of Satan and the work of society. I want you to see the work of the Savior. The work of the Savior. Look what happens in verse 6. And by the way, if you highlight your Bible, this would be the place to put the star. Put a little star by this verse. (laughs) I get goosebumps every time I read this verse right here. Here's a guy who's demon-possessed. Satan tried to sink the boat in the middle as they were coming across on this divine appointment. He gets to the other side. This guy comes to meet him, right? And it's interesting as he comes to meet him, notice what it says in verse 6. This is mind-boggling. Look what it says. It says, and when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he what? He worshiped him. Some of your translations said he fell down. The word literally means he was kissing the hand of Jesus. He was worshiping. You say, wait a minute, brother Gary, you're trying to tell me demons would worship Jesus? No, no. But see, for just a moment, just for a moment, he was in his right mind once again. And he's created in the image of God, and we were created to do what? To worship God. It's only when we get away from God and want nothing to do with God that we fail to worship him. But this man at the moment who's demon possessed comes and he sees Jesus and he falls at the feet of Jesus and begins to worship him. That's why Jesus had that divine appointment. Matter of fact, right here from this verse, everything is going to change. It's going to change dramatically right here. Look what happens in verse 7. Here's what happens. Uh, Jesus in his work. I want you to see Jesus dealing with the demons. Jesus and the demons. Look what happens in verse 7. After this man is worshiping Jesus, all of a sudden the demon comes back out with him. Look at verse 7. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Wow. Did you see that? That, that wasn't just by the man. That was, that was by the demon that was inside of him. He didn't want to be tormented. By the way, he recognized this demon. He recognized who Jesus was. Think about it. He, he knew who Jesus was. He recognized him. Now, earlier, in a few chapters before that, you'll see the religious leaders come in, and they don't recognize Jesus. They just think he's a good teacher. Kind of a, a magician or something, too. All these tricks he can do or whatever. No, it's not tricks. It's a miracle. It's miracles. And they couldn't acknowledge him as the son of God, but every demon does. They, when they see Jesus, they know their ultimate doom. That's why he begged him not to torment him. And he called him the son of God. That's sad to say because we live in a world that doesn't want to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the son of God. Every demon in hell will. Matter of fact, if you did a survey in hell, you know, how, how many deacons are deacons? Demons. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> grab that that whoops i've done that before (laughs) um how how many demons in hell believe in the virgin birth every demon how many demons believe that jesus is truly the son of god every one of them 100 percent. you don't have to raise your hands or anything like that i'm interviewing the demons all right How, how many of you demons how many demons believe that jesus paid the price for sin on the cross yep Believe that. How many demons will worship him? Not one. One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. But they're not going to do it. But they acknowledge who Jesus is and they don't want to be tormented. And it's interesting, he recognized who Jesus was. So what does Jesus do? He rebukes him. Notice what it says in the very next verse. And he said unto him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Wow. He asked him to give him a name, and what's he do? He gives him a number. 
A number, yeah, the, the term legion is a number. And it's a big debate. If you've studied the word of God, you'll find out, if you try to find out what is a legion, they go back and forth. It's a minimal, it's a minimal of 2,000 troops. It goes all the way up to 8,000. It can go from 2,000 to 8,000. Let me tell you something, this guy's got a lot of demons. It's not just one unclean spirit in there. There's at least 2,000. He asked him for his name. He gives him a number. We are legion. We are legion. That's what it says in the next verse. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. In here, Jesus has rebuked the demon. After they recognized who he was, he said to come out. They know what their final doom is, the lake of fire. They don't want to go there. They ask Jesus, don't, you know, and he says, um, they don't want to be taken out of that town. Don't make us depart out of this town. Well, wh what's going on in that town? Now, let me tell you what my opinion is on this. I, I think there are parts of the world that are more populated by demons than other parts of the world. How about that? I think it's when you start getting God out of the equation, you're going to find out that's part of the problem in this situation. When you try to get God out of the equation, and by the way, America's headed down that slippery slope, aren't we? They don't want them to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Why? Because it has a couple words in there. You know, one nation. Yeah, they don't like that. Or our, our currency. They don't want to say, you know. As a matter of fact, I saw that in the state of Tennessee, they're supposed to put it up in every room. In God, we trust. Wow. How long is that lawsuit going to last? And it's, it's our national motto. They don't want God. They don't want anything to do with God. And take a look at the cities across America. Yeah, Chattanooga, by the way, Chattanooga's got its problems too. But we're the most Bible-minded city in America, and we got our problems. But I believe there's in other cities across America that are really things really bad. There's more demon possession and more spiritual uh, darkness activity going on. And you go to different parts of the world, and the same thing is going on. These guys didn't want to leave because things were great right there. You're going to find out that they, they're not really crazy about God in this country right here, in this place. Well, the demons recognized him and he rebuked them. And notice what it says in the next verse. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Bear in mind, there's 2,000 demons at minimal in him. And maybe that's how many there are because notice what it says next. And at once Jesus gave them permission and the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Whoa, that's it? Yep. Here's a question. Why the water? Why would these demons who inhabited this man Leave, go to the pigs, take the pigs to the water and drown them all. There's something about water. Remember, Jesus was on the water when Satan came after him, right? There's another time in which the winds and the waves are out there and Jesus gets out. And you know what? I love this because he walks on the water. He walks on it. He has authority over it. But there's something interesting about the water. If you study, if, and this is me right here, okay? Um, I've yet to find anybody else that kind of believes the same thing I do on this, but here's, here's my opinion on this. If you look at creation and look at Genesis and look at the creation days, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and on the seventh day, he rested, right? Take a look. It's kind of interesting what it says there. On day one, he created the heavens and the earth and, and goes through and says, in the evening and the morning were the first day. And God looked at it and said, this is good. It is good. On the second day, he separated the waters above from the waters below. Put a separation between them. Do you know the earth was cut? When someone says, you, you believe the earth was flooded? How about this? Twice. Twice. Yeah, when God created it, it was totally flooded. There was no land when it was there. It was just all water. And then he flooded it with Noah when he, when he had brought judgment on the earth. Second day, it says he separated the waters above from the waters below. And it says in the evening and the morning were the second day. He left out a couple of things, right? He didn't say it was good. Well, maybe there were other days. On the third day, he separated the, the land from the sea. He called the uh, land, the dry land, earth, and he called the sea, the water, seas, all right? On the fourth day, he put the sun, moon, and stars out there. On the fifth day, he created the birds and the fish, 
put them out there. And on the sixth day, he created man. And by the way, every day he says, it is good, it is good, it is good. He creates man, it is good. Seventh day he rests, it's very good. Only one day of the week, he didn't say it was good. What day was that? Monday. So it's either one of two things. Either God hates Mondays or something happened on Monday that God didn't say it was good. What could happen on Monday? Well, I, I believe everything was created on the first day. There was only God, period. And then God creates heavens and earth. No angels until that. Angels are created. Hev- the heavens are created right there. All that's created. Angels are created with perfect knowledge. They have a free will. Uh, they, they, they can make choices. And the very next day, they made a choice, a third of them, with Satan, that they want enough that we will be as God. And they were cast out of heaven. Now, it never says that in any verse, in the Bible, but that they were cast out of heaven. I believe they were created on the first day and they had perfect knowledge and made that choice and they rebelled against God and they were cast out of heaven. And it's when they separated the waters above from the waters below, it'd be an interesting Bible study. Here, the pigs run right into the ocean and drown. Well, let's talk about Jesus in society. What's going to happen here? Look, Jesus in society. We see Jesus in the demons. Let's talk to Jesus in society. Verse 14. So those who fed the swine <laughs> fled, and they told it to the city and the country, and they went out to see what was, what, was go- what was going on. Everybody's coming out. What's going on out here? We just heard everything about it. You know why they went out there, so many people? Because they heard swine flu. That comes with the turf. I'm sorry. Um, The swine didn't fly, Brother Gary. Okay, they did a swine dive, right? And and at the bottom, deviled ham. I'm sorry. I'm guys. One more. (laughs) The first bay of pigs. But anyways, all right. But yeah. This was major, 2,000 swine over the top and and all drowned right there. So what's going on? Well, notice what it says in verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, who had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. There it is. He's in his right mind. Why? Jesus has delivered him. He set him free. And what happened? And they were afraid. They never seen anything like this. They, they remember this guy. Tried to put chains on him. Chains couldn't hold him. They took him through a program. That didn't help. They isolated him. They'd heard stories about him. And here he is in his right mind. And they were afraid. And let me tell you this. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And here's people with the fear of the Lord. It's kind of interesting in this passage. Verse 16 it says, And those who saw them told them how it had happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Basically, they revered Jesus. They revered him. They, they gave him great respect. They'd never seen anything like this before. Notice what it says in the very next verse, though, verse, 18, uh, verse 17. Then they began to plead with him, you need to be our Messiah. We have been waiting and praying for you to come. You're our Messiah. Is that what your translation says? No, it doesn't. That's what you would think it would say, right? Here he just acknowledged... There's only one guy that can do this. He took on 2,000 demons at one time, cast them into the pigs. They ran over the and here he is, their Messiah. Wow. They didn't receive him. What's it say? Look at the verse. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. They rejected him. They rejected him. Why did they reject Jesus? To be quite frank, I think it's because he ruined their economy. When 2,000 pigs are, are done, that's it. And, and by the way, this was a demonic hangout, this area. They want nothing to do with Jesus or God. Please go your own way. Well, we see Jesus working the demons and in society. Let's talk about Jesus and the man. Jesus and the man. Look what it says in verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. 
What happened? He got saved, and what does he want to do? He wants to be with Jesus. Can you get an amen on that? Where would you want to be? Your life is transformed. You had no hope, no help, and now Jesus has delivered you. You'd want to be with Jesus. Amen? How about his church? Now, that's different, Brother Gary. I don't know about being with the church, you know, and things like all them hypocrites in there. Church got hypocrites, yeah. Yeah, lots of churches have hypocrites. I like what Daryl says. We always got room for one more, so come on. Come on. Now, you know what the church is? Church is a healing place. It's a place of people that are sinners who are saved by grace. Saved by grace. You know what happened? This man was delivered. When he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. What did Jesus do? You know what Jesus did? He did what we ought to do with everyone who gets delivered. If people find hope and help, what should we do? We need to disciple them. Disciple them. That's what Jesus did. He discipled them. He didn't tell them, go take a 10-week program on how to witness. He said, no, go tell them everything that God did for you. Notice verse 20. And he departed and began to proclaim Decapolis, in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and they all marveled. You know, when Jesus shows up, there's always hope and help. It made, it made all the day. This was a divine appointment. God knew he would be there. He went to rescue him, deliver him, set his feet on a rock and get him going. And sometimes we look at people and say, there's no way this person could ever turn their life around. Don't underestimate the grace of God. Never underestimate the grace of God. Let's pray together. Heads bowed and eyes closed.